ticking down. Get everyone ready, get your settings correct so that we can uh, have a nice couple of hours speaking weightlifting. I see we've gone back to the old rules, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will have exciting three minute and one minute breaks so that um, you will have a chance to, um, to do errands in between the presentations. This summer, we're hoping to host three of these webinars. This is the first of the three. And um, we are hoping that everything will go well. We're excited. Um, this is new for us and um, we're doing our best. But the, the good thing about this is that we will be discussing weightlifting and, and that we can. So it's just all the technical stuff around here that makes this exciting. So if you're just logging in, we have the countdown. We'll start with our first presenter. Um, in a bit, we will present the people here and uh, move forward then with our webinar. And this is the first of series of three webinars that the IWF Coaching and Research Committee will be doing this summer. I'll go through how the Zoom webinar works. Here after we have presentations, um, I see we're already getting some uh, messages in the chat. Um, and um, also for everyone to know that you are muted, I will get to that. Okay, time to take a deep breath and uh, start with our presentations. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Carolina Lundahl. I'm the deputy chair of the coaching and research committee in International Weightlifting Federation. And unfortunately, apologies for our uh, chair, uh, Mahmoud Magoub. He unfortunately has a competition to attend to and could not come to our webinar. Uh, we will miss him. Um, so today we will have three presentations and you will have the Q&A button at the end uh, of the bottom of your screen, I'm sorry. And if you want to leave questions there, you may, re you may leave them there. The panel will be reviewing questions and then making them visible. This is going to be about a two hour set. And also for your knowledge, all the participants will be muted throughout the webinar. Um, here, uh, so my name is Carolina and we also have uh, panelists from the IWF Coaching and Research Committee, Mr. Mohammed Ahmed Al Harbi, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Dr. Yunichi Okada from Japan. And we have also members who are also presenting, Dr. Kyle Pierce from the USA. And then we will also have um, Avinash Pandu from Indonesia joining us from there. So I'm ready to present our first presenter. And once you see this, um, she is joining us directly from Japan. The Tokyo Olympic Games will start in 42 days and soon the whole world will be tuning into Tokyo. You can read about Reiko's achievements on the screen. They are impressive. 
She's a national pioneer in women's weightlifting, having been an athlete, a coach, and now she is a high-level technical official. Our sport is in good hands with Reiko and her team. So ladies and gentlemen, the Tokyo Olympic Games weightlifting sport manager, Reiko Kato Chinen. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, allow me to join your uh, seminar. It's a very honor for me. I'm Reiko Chinen, uh, Tokyo 2020 Weightlifting Sport Manager. Uh, at the same time, I'm member of the IWF Technical Committee. Okay, let me start my presentation. So can I have the access right? Mr. Yarno, uh, can you give me the right? Okay. Hello? Yarno? There is some issues with screen share. Yeah, we're working on it. Thank you. So Reiko will give us some information about uh, Tokyo Games and especially in these uh, times when um, we are very restricted on what we can do in the Olympic game uh, uh, participation. Okay, we know we're gonna do the thing. We are gonna share the screen for Reiko and he, she can talk if we get him her back. Okay. Reiko, we, will, we have solved the issue so that um, our co-host will share the screen. And if you just tell him when to uh, move to the next page, we will do that. The problem is I think we completely lost Reiko at the moment. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So Diarno is showing the uh, PowerPoint, right? Yes, he will share it. Okay. Okay, I think weightlifting is much easier. Yeah, you know, just uh, lift. <laughs> Here we go. Excellent. This looks good. Please, Reiko. Okay. Thank you very much. So now I am going to speak about Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. And uh, it is not so easy, uh, Olympic Games, uh, different from the past editions, of course, because of the corona uh, countermeasures. And for anybody who is coming to Tokyo for the games, you will have, unfortunately, a lot of restrictions, which may be a, a little bit stressful for you. So the next, please. The IOC, together with International Paralympic Committee and Tokyo 2020, published so-called the playbook. The playbooks has several options. One is, of course, for the athletes and the team officials. Other than that, we have several uh, playbooks, such for international federations, Olympic family, or a press, or a media, like that. Then, of course, now I am going to explain about the playbook for the athletes and the officials. And we have more than 60 pages of the playbooks, but uh, today we only focus for some important points for you. So I will show you only seven or eight pages. So next please. So this is about the plane sports. For 
some people, it is very quite normal uh, countermeasures, such as keep physical interac uh, interactions with the others, or avoid physical contact, keep physical distancing, and uh, avoid enclosed spaces and clouds. And uh, for this is uh, very special to use only the games, vehicles, but for the athletes and the team officials, you cannot use the public transportation. And also, if you are the athlete or uh, team official, you are belonging to your National Olympic Committee. Then your National Olympic Committee uh, has COVID-19 liaison officer and the liaison officer submit to the government of Japan your activity sheet. So can you click once? So do not use public transport and your activity list will be submitted to the government of Japan. And please think about hygiene you are requested to put your mask on all the time, except if you are the athlete, except while training or competition or while you are eating or you are sleeping. And keep washing your hand, disinfect your hands. And whenever you watch the competition, do not shout, do not cheer, but just clap your hand. Whenever possible, please avoid using shared items. But of course, we are using the barbell, plates, everything. For example, during the competition, during the training, so the Tokyo 2020 and the national technical officials are ready to disinfect all the competition equipment and training equipment every time from the scales, barbells, plates. So they will disinfect every time. And even for the coaches, they are requested to bring their own stationery, such for the weighing or at the marshal's table. So this is very important uh, countermeasure. And we recommend you to ventilate wherever possible. For your information, our venue is automatically uh, ventilate 24 hours, uh, seven days. So please click. So important is you wear mask and do not forget to bring your own mask and you will need many sheets of mask, okay? So this is about your travel. So you need to uh, be ready uh, to take test before your departure. And you need to obtain the negative COVID-19 certificate. And you need to take the PCR test two times before your departure. And I will explain more about this later. So click please. So you will get two PCR tests within 96 hours of your departure from the country. Please. And importantly, you need to submit 
the COVID-19 negative certificate according to the format which is designated by the government of Japan. Next, please. And when you travel, you have to bring the certificates with you together with your passport. Do not put into your luggage, but please bring with your passport. Next, please. So when you enter Japan, please be ready to turn on your mobile phone. And also, not only the negative certificate, but you need several important documentation. So you have to follow the direction of your National Olympic Committee. So you need to be ready to show the necessary documentation at the immigration officer. And also, upon the arrival, you will get be tested. So be ready to submit your uh, testing. So can you please click? Yes. Be ready to show your documentation and your mobile phone. Click please. You will be get tested. Next. And uh, this is the same procedure as the past games. You will bring pre-validated accreditation card. So at the airport, you need to validate your accreditation and please, you go to so-called TA bus, transport for acid, to go to the Olympic village. Next, please. And when you leave Japan, some of you need to take another PCR test so that you enter your own country back. Next, please. So if you need this kind of test, please consult with your National Olympic Committee. Next, please. So from those uh, summarized playbook contents, uh, I will explain you about important notes. Next, please. Very important point is two times PCR test before your departure. Now I explain, uh, assuming that you are a Brazilian, then your home is located in Brasilia, which is the capital city of Brazil. Then to reach to Japan, first you need to use domestic flight to Sao Paulo. Then your international flight from, uh, starts from Sao Paulo, first to go to Zurich. This is the Switzerland. And from Zurich, uh, you fly to Japan. So in this case, where 96 hours start. So your departure time for this PCR test is your start point of your international flight. It means your departure city is not Brasilia, but Sao Paulo, which is flying to Switzerland. Then it is a little bit tricky because IOC requires everybody to take two times PCR test within 96 hours in prior to your departure from Brazil. 
or your own country. However, most importantly, to enter Japan, the government of Japan requires only once PCR testing within 72 hours in prior to your departure from your country. It means, next slide please. The first example, uh, departing from Brazil, once you took within the 72 hours in prior to your departure from Sao Paulo, and another one within the 96 hours uh, in prior to your uh, departing Sao Paulo. And those two testing cannot be done on a different day. So first example, once within the 72 hours and once uh, within 96 hours, um, those testing were uh, carried out in the different, different day. So in this case, you can enter Japan. Second example, you did two times within 72 hours in prior to your departure and two tests were carried out on a different day. This is also okay. You can enter Japan. However, the last one, you didn't take test 72 hours in prior to your departure, but you did two times within 96 hours from your departure, but different day. In that case, you cannot enter Japan, although you satisfied the requirement from the IOC. So please be careful at least once you have to take PCR test within 72 hours in prior to your departure from your nation. This is very important. Recently, there are several times uh, test events of the other sport were carried out in Japan. However, several athletes and team officials they couldn't enter Japan because they made mistake in the time of the PCR test. So you have to be very careful for the PCR test. Next, please. Not only the timing, but you need to use the designated PCR test format uh, designated by the government of Japan. You can visit this uh, website uh, with uh, this URL. Then there you can find the designated uh, formats in the different languages. So there are 15 language options. So I would like to recommend you to use this format as much as possible. In case if the doctor or clinic refuse to use this format, however, the items of testing must be exactly as same as this format. So please study and please follow the order of your National Olympic Committee. Next, please. While you are in Japan, you cannot to go anywhere you want. Unfortunately, you have to keep away from shopping more or 
you cannot enter the bar or you cannot enter restaurant on the street. So you your activity is very much limited. One is Olympic Village or one is in training venue or one is in the competition venue like that. And your National Olympic Committee submit the, your activity sheet. So you have to follow wherever uh, the location which is listed in the activity sheet. And also, while you are stay, athletes and team officials will be tested. You need to uh, you need to submit your saliva uh, when wherever uh, specified, and this testing. If you are member of athlete or team official, you have to submit every day, even on your competition day. If your competition starts very early in the morning, still you can submit your saliva uh, at the evening. If your competition is late at night, you need to submit your saliva uh, in the morning before 9 a.m., like that. And this decision to carry out the PCR test every day is decision made by the International Olympic Committee. So please follow the IOC. Next, please. If some of you or some of your coaches do not stay in the Olympic Village while we are in the competition time, then if you or your coach stay in some hotel or something, such accommodation must be approved by the government of Japan. So you need to be careful. Uh, your coach need to be careful if you or they do not stay in the village. Uh, check with your National Olympic Committee if the accommodation is approved one or not. If the accommodation is not approved one, then you need to rebook your accommodation and you need to change your plan from one hotel to the other hotel. Otherwise, you cannot enter Japan. So please be careful. And if you have any case like that, please also to report to the IWF, okay? So next please. Now I would like to have your questions. Carolina, okay? Yes, hello. I have, first I have just one question. When it said masks, is it regulated? What kind of masks can you wear? I'm wearing a plastic half mask. Would that be acceptable? Or is there a specific type of mask that one has to wear? Okay. Your, what is uh, you are now wearing is not accepted without the cross mask or uh, multiple layered uh, mask, like surgical mask. And uh, there is another type of some plastic things uh, covering the fully your face. If wizard mask, that kind of plastic uh, face cover is not accepted too. So okay. please bring your 
surgical mask. And whenever you are sweating, you need to change from time to time. And if you are using the cross type mask, you need to uh, wash at least once per day by using hot water. Okay, thank you. I'm going to now share the questions that we have gotten um, to show here. And uh, these are just random questions that we're going to ask our expert in Tokyo. Um, how long does it take from the athlete's village to the competition venue? Okay, uh, the distance is 14, one four kilometers by bus it will take 25 minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Next question was, when are the first weightlifting teams arriving in Tokyo? Okay. Uh, originally, uh, the IOC was planning to open the first training venue on 14th of July. However, IOC made another decision to apply so-called minus five days rule. The first competition day for weightlifting is 24th of July, and minus five is 19th of July. So the first training day, training day is 19th of July. Therefore, in general, uh, the first arrival day is 18 of July. However, there are some long distance flight. For example, from South America, you need to travel maybe two days. In such case, athletes are really difficult to do training upon the arrival. In such case, if your National Olympic Committee submit the request to the IOC, then uh, such nation can arrive two days maximum before the original uh, arrival day, which means the first team arriving at Tokyo in weightlifting is on 16th of July. However, they cannot carry out the training in such case. Anyway, the first training day is 19th of July. Okay. Then there's this word, uh, when one goes through the uh, playbooks, there's a word called Coco. What is Coco about? This is mobile application. And uh, this can detect whenever you stayed more than 15 minutes with some COVID-19 patient, this Coco app shows you had close contact. The meaning of COCOA is COVID-19 contact application. This is using Bluetooth of mobile phone. And I, as I read that it is mandatory for everyone to download this. Yes, mandatory. And also there will be another uh, mobile app which you have to use, which means a uh, health monitoring app. And there will be another name which hasn't been published yet. So every day you need to submit your body temperature every morning. And also you need to answer several questions which is asking about your condition. So bring your uh, thermometer too. And in Japan, 
Celsius is used. Okay. Oh, this was this will be uh, exciting also just just to be there. Let's look at our next question, which comes from our athletes. Will athletes have to quarantine and be unable to train when they arrive in Japan? And will having the vaccine or not make a difference to these rules? Okay, uh, for the first question, uh, athletes doesn't need to undergo quarantine. It means on the next day of the arrival, already they can start training. That is why they have to respect a lot of tough restriction. If you do not want to uh, suffer this kind of uh, restriction, you need to undergo 14 days quarantine. Then you can get freedom, but you will lose your muscle volume instead. The second question, vaccination is uh, strongly recommended by the International Olympic Committee. However, either you were vaccinated or not doesn't change anything of your life in Tokyo. Okay, right. good. This is, uh, this is the last of the questions. Tell us about something in the preparation to the games that have been rewarding, excellent, nice, something that you have really enjoyed personally. Currently, zero. It's really, really tough. Every day I am arriving at my office before 7.30 and sometimes I'm leaving the office midnight. There are so many things to do, especially because of COVID things. It's really, 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 really tough. So zero rewarding so far, but hopefully, hopefully I feel something uh, good feeling after the games is over. So yes. Pray for me. Yes. Um, and uh, we are so happy that you could join us and we want to wish you all the good luck in the final stages. And uh, we can hear how hard you are working. And uh, we know you are a professional and uh, we will have an excellent weightlifting Olympic Games in Tokyo. Um, we had one more page. Did you have the one more page in your slide? Because I'm done with this, so I will stop sharing. And uh, we can go into, um, did you have one more page in your? Uh... Yeah, just, just thank you very much. Yes. OK, if you have any questions for Reiko, you can put them into the chat, and we can see if we will be able to answer them. Um, we understand that Reiko is very busy. We hear she has very long days and we were very happy that she could bring us this up-to-date, uh, very important information. So um, thank you, Reiko. Um, thank you. We will move on to our next uh, presenter. Our next presenter is joining us from Indonesia, Java Timur. Mr. Avinash Pandu. He is consultant to weightlifting team Jama Timur in Indonesia. Avinash, he is an educator and a high performance coach. He's been a member of the IWF Coaching and Research Committee for a few years already, and he has presented many lectures for the IWF in coaching and development programs. So ladies and gentlemen, Avinash Pandu, uh, we'll start sharing his screen in about 20, 15 seconds as we go. Hello, Avinash. 
Avinash. Avinash, have we lost you? Hello, Avinash. I think we lost you there for a while. And um, can yeah. we do so that everyone else except our presenter uh, mutes their microphones here in the panel side? So let's mute our microphones and we will give the floor to Mr. Avinash Pandu. Thank you. Hi, good uh, morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. And uh, welcome to this first edition of the IWF uh, webinar. I will be talking today about a topic which uh, I have uh, been witnessing uh, over and over in many competitions, in training, and as well uh, as an educator as well within uh, the field of uh, sports. And uh, we'll be talking today about choking. And choking here, I'm not talking about something stuck into your throat and you cannot breathe, but it's more related to our game where we cannot uh, perform to our expected, uh, expected level. So the topic today is how to stop choking in weightlifting. Now, before we go on to this, I just want to bring you up a bit that uh, we have to look a bit now into the field of uh, sports psychology. And psychology is now becoming a very important topic that we are dealing with uh, because sports is becoming so demanding. Performance, winning is becoming so demanding. Therefore, we have to look beyond the field of uh, training, coaching, and so on, but more integrating a bit into the field of sports psychology. And that's what would be we'll be dealing on today. So sports psychology is a study of mental factors as they relate to athletes, also used for team sports, as well as individual endeavors. Sports psychology, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the most recent advances of psychological branches. Success or failure on the field often de depends on mental factors as much as physical ones. In modern sports, where winning is placed at the top of the list, we recognize the dramatic impact of the athlete mindset and focus on preparing the mind to overcome obstacles on the field while boosting confidence for optimal performance. This is what I term in as we need to take the practice skills to competitions. And when we talk about practice skills to competition, we need to take also that field of psychology as well from the training to the competition. My next uh, slide I'm going to, to present on is uh, basically just about st uh, stress, sorry, is just about stress. Often we hear that athletes uh, often term the point is, oh, we are stressed in training. I want to put on to here that stress is actually very good in a sense. We need to have this kind of stress placed onto our athletes. I'm not talking up uh, with our coaches, with our uh, managers in sports and so on. It's good to put up those stresses in training. But however, too much stress is dangerous. This is what can lead to impaired performance. It can lead to some athletes definitely cannot handle competitions. Therefore, what we need to look at here, we need to look at that optimum stress placed on that athlete. Not too much, not too little, but that optimum uh, stress where the athlete can therefore perform into its optimum capacity. Now, for the, for the purpose of our presentation, I will speak about choking, as I mentioned earlier, as it affects a lot of weightlifters and athletes in practical reality. You will agree with me, many listeners out there will say, oh, I had a very good preparation. My coach did so well. I, we did so very well into training. We put everything together. Arriving to competition, it just didn't happen. What happened there? What's, what we need to look into, into there is what we call the effect of choking. So choking here is defined by a situation 
where an individual performs lower than he or she is capable of while under pressure. At first glance, it would seem strange that people would perform worse when the most is on the line and where they are often trying their hardest. So this is what I'm talking about here. We need to look at this beyond training. Choking appears to occur when an individual attempts to consciously, to consciously, I'm repeating this word again, to consciously control a well-practiced automatic skills. We all know that weightlifting demands so much in terms of our technique, in terms of our speed, and so on like this. But we also need to look at that conscious mind control as well there into that automated skill. Complex motor skills are controlled unconsciously by the cerebellum. Consciously controlling these skills shift control to the slower, more deliberate prefrontal cortex causing a potential drop in performance. So this is where athletes you start getting a bit uh, complex, starts getting a bit edgy and so on. So we'll talk a bit more about that and what we need to do in that terms in order to avoid those uh, choking uh, times. Now let's look at the causes of choking. When we talk about causes of choking, we need to look at uh, some factors we're going to be looking at, internal factors, external factors, and so on. So choking typically occurs in high pressure situations where there is an audience and expectations are high. The Olympic committee is pressurizing you here. We want the gold medal. We want the medal. We want the performance. The coach is expecting you here to get, deliver those PBs. You are expecting yourself, family pressures and so on like this. So chokings tend to occur in individuals who are anxious, fatigue, not having a good night's sleep, We'll talk about that just, uh, just now. Fatigue and are concerned about the performance and have made similar mistakes in the past. So what happened? We tend to see that circles repeat itself. Okay, this is from a study of Hills and Short 2013. Internal and external focus is my next point I'll talk on. Now. The terms internal focus and external focus describe the attentional focus on an athlete. In other words, they explain what the athlete is thinking about when he or she is trying to perform an action. Studies have shown that external focus, focusing on the effect of your movement. Okay, for example, for us here, we are focusing too much uh, on, the, on the technique and so on like this. And sometimes it can be dangerous, but it's also effective rather than internal focus, focus on the mechanics. How are you going to pull? Now you're having everyone shouting there, come on, more pull, more this, more that. Now you pull too much and the bar gets to a swing. So we need to also look into that. So having an internal focus has been found to increase the likelihood of choking across a variety of sports. Again, we are talking about those mechanics that have already been developed. Often I hear coaches talking about those areas in competitions. So it creates a confusion now when an athlete stepping on the platform. Do I have to pull too much? Or am I not pulling enough? Am I pulling too much? Is my back not tight? Is my, and so on. So it creates a bit of that extra thinking and can create big confusion in the end of the day and cause an athlete to miss the weight, which I have seen in practice myself as a coach many, many times. Next one we'll talk on is the coping style. The coping style is an, is an approach. Coping style means that you actively take in on threatening information and try to solve the problem. And avoidant coping styles mean that you avoid stressful information. So approach coping styles have been found to be associated with choking, especially here when we are dealing with competition. Avoidant coping style, in contrast, have no negative effect on performance under pressure. That's uh, a study of uh, Wang and uh, Marchant of 2005. So here I want to bring up a point of reiterance is that if you are not training a competitive mindset in practices, you will not have a competitive mindset in competitions. 
So please, there are all those automatic skills that are already there. Don't try now to overthink about it. This is when you start threatening those informations. Is, am I getting enough of my, uh, my pulse? Is my leg strong enough, uh, you know, into the clean? Am I going to clean and do not the jerk? Last time I missed the jerk on this and so on. So it creates that, that threatening information and it can lead to choking. Now, how to decrease choking? There are a number of strategies have been shown to be effective in preventing or reduce choking and thus increasing the margin of performance or achieving optimum performance. When we talk here between performance and arousal, we need to have that optimum arousal for performance to happen. If it's too low, we don't have that, uh, that huge performance. We have a decline in performance. And if it's uh, too much uh, anxiety, too much uh, uh, excitations and, and so on, also will lead to a decline in performance. So we need to have that optimum arousal in order for optimum performance to take place. I think this is clear enough. You can see it here onto, onto the picture, that optimum arousal for optimal performance. Now I'll bring you up to some uh, key areas. I use also quite a lot with, uh, with training, with competitions and leading up to major competitions, also into, into training day by day. I talk a lot to my athletes about uh, imagery, visualizations. Often we tend to see that athletes tend to be a bit uh, proact uh, proactive, reactive, and sometimes uh, just doesn't get the, the, the picture. So we need to bring them to an area of proactive rather than being reactive, which means here making a mistake and then, oh yeah, okay, I didn't pull enough, I didn't this. So this is where imagery or visualization comes in very, very handy. Let's talk about imagery. Imagery is the process of improving your sporting performance by practicing purely in your mind. To some extent, imagery is superior to physical training because you can train anywhere, anytime. I am sure many of you have had the COVID situation in your country where you have been uh, back home, you haven't been able to train. And often you're doing those uh, visualization training, those imagery training and so on. And it creates a certain stimulation for the muscle and you don't lose any of those mechanics already developed. Imagery is recommended for motivational and also cognitive functions. Imagery allows one to experience imaginary victory, which if vividly imagined can enhance self-confidence according to modern coaching science. So yes, I have seen uh, this very, very lively into my training. Imagery and visualization does work sometimes wonders. I saw it coming out of COVID, coming back into training where we had to put our athletes uh, for training. Very little loss was, uh, was seen into that area. Why? Because while we were doing uh, Zoom training and so on, we spoke a lot about imagery and visualization with our, with our athletes. Often they can feel even the, 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 the weight uh, feeling, the, 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 the amount of weight, how they are bringing up uh, the exertion of uh, force and so on like this. All that can be done through imagery and, or visualization. Next one we'll talk about is simulation. Very important uh, topic. Often uh, I have seen, uh, not often, but it's becoming now more and more uh, common into modern times. Simulation is the practice of training in an environment that is specifically designed to emulate actual conditions during competition. For example, practicing in the very competition area where you, you later compete. We saw early on some question being put to Reiko about when is the training taking place. Athletes don't want to come into Tokyo two days before the competition. They want to have that simulation pattern. They want to know where is the competition venue? How is it? How much distance from my warm-up platform to the competition uh, platform? How is my training uh, area and so on like this? Why it can bring them 
a sense of happiness and a sense of uh, being able to deliver and being able to produce the result when needed. And also another point, we have seen it very often now happening in many countries and also now becoming more and more popular in weightlifting is where university and professional teams uh, sometimes open their practices to the public or opening up the training centers for other teams to join in so that they can match, but they can, uh, they can uh, how we can call it, level up to other, other athletes and so on like this, gain that extra bit. And sometimes it is just pure motivation. Sometimes it is just, uh, you know, the, the team bonding together and bringing up different simulation patterns. Focus is my next, uh, my next uh, topic, focus. Often we hear those terms by coaches, focus. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take a few seconds here to ponder about this point, focus. Are we trying to say that if an athlete is in competition, he or she is not focused? A point maybe now here for coaches. Let's have a look into it. Focus refers to undivided attention on the execution of a particular pattern or skill, okay, to the extent that you shut down the outside world. Train your focus by using imagery to picture performing, uh, performing the simplest version of a skill that you want to focus on. We cannot go to a competition and there we're going to start talking about the athletes you know, uh, focus onto your back, focus on keeping uh, your shoulders uh, down or your elbows and pull up and, and pulls and traps and so on like this. These are things that have already been, been, been worked in into training. And when these areas are not being dealt in, this is where an athlete goes into overfocus. If we may put it in this term in between brackets, they go into overfocus and they create problems and often failures, which leads into a poor performance. Practice doing so without analysis or self-consciousness and gradually focus on more complex skills. Focus becomes more difficult as you get better at a sport because the demands made upon you become more complex. Coaches, athletes, please, Take a look on this point. Focus becomes more difficult as you get better at a sport Folk because the demands made upon you become more complex. If I may bring you up to maybe a point, if I may just speak on, okay, of our very late pocket Hercules, Mayim Sulemanoglu of uh, three Olympics uh, back or four Olympics back where he had a lost into three snatches. And he is an athlete that we have seldom saw immersed in a competition. How did that athlete focus after missing an opener, missing a second? Okay, I let you ponder a bit on that point. All right, and uh, here I have uh, athlete of uh, one athlete from China, which is a picture courtesy of the IWF website. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, focus also has to be very, very important. Next point I dealt with, goal setting. As a coach, as an educator, as a former athlete, I have seen many times athletes suffer at goal setting. Either the goal is set too high or the goal is set too low or simply the course is not set properly. A sports psychology assumes that goal setting is the key to motivation. Self-motivation create clear, sharp, long-term goals and break these down into smaller, medium-term goals. Break down these medium-term goals into short-term goals so that you can have a clear connection between what you do every day and your long-term goals. Advisors, mind tools, personal goal setting. 
often the athletes tend to judge their short-term goals that with their long-term goals and they don't see it. oh maybe the time is too far or maybe the time is too close now they start panicking and they start to break down so we need to have a look at these goal setting so coaches if you're dealing with uh, team psychologists and uh, athletes please do take these into consideration not only we as coaches know our goal for the athletes but sometimes the athletes are also having a lot of headache into those areas. How does goal setting work? Goals direct attention to task at hand and highlights what needs to be completed. It allows you to implement strategies to develop specific elements that needs to be utilized to complete the goal. For example, now I have to make a goal now that my uh, parameters on strength is on par. I have to set up now my technique. I have to work on this time to this time now on certain parameters and certain technical evaluations need to take place. I have to drop my body weight. So these are all goals that have to be looked at. Goals mobilize your efforts. It's basically sometimes pull you back on the, on the trail, on the train uh, track. It puts you back into focus and what you're doing. You will put your efforts into moving towards the goal as you're provided with the incentive of completing the goal. Goals prolong your persistence because you are rewarded with incentives as you achieve your goals. The incentives could be you're getting your results that you wanted. You're getting uh, the, the, the different uh, needs uh, analysis that you're putting in. You're getting the reward there. So you're happy. You're moving on towards the right way. People who set goals stick at task for longer as they are achieving smaller goals that combine form larger goals. So into general, you are achieving what you're setting yourself to. Goals foster the development of new learning strategies. In order to achieve the goals, you may need to develop new strategies at times to complete the task at hand. Okay, so please, if the goal is, for example, you're miss around your lifting, you're missing up a certain point into the lift, maybe you need to do a bit of visualization like I spoke earlier on to bring that up into par or maybe do a bit of... Uh, video analysis, looking at what you are not doing and start to work onto these areas so that you can correct them and move towards your goal. Types of goal. There are three types of goal that the athlete, coach, or team leader needs to be aware of. As we are leading now to the Olympics, it's very important we remain only about uh, 48, 47 days to the Olympics. We need to be taking real uh, measure of the dimensions of the goal. Okay, what are we looking at here? The outcome. This is the end result. For example, getting the order ready for dispatch by designated time. By the end of June, I want to be ready to achieve this goal in terms of my body weight. I need to be able to achieve this goal in terms of my squats in terms of my pulls, in terms of my lifting, and so on and so forth. Process. This is the actions needed to execute the goal correctly. What are the process you're going to be doing? Oh, my lifting has not been going well. Let me review a bit maybe here. I need to do a bit of video analysis. I have to put on a bit more fitness and so on like this. So these are the process which will lead to that, to that outcome. Performance. These are the standards independent of other variables. So these are, again, standards independent of other variables. And I put it down into a small sketch for you into the next slide. You can have a look at how do the type of goals fit in together. So process plus performance equals outcome. Okay? Process plus performance equal outcome. Oops. 
Sorry, I kind of, okay. Let's look now at key principles of goal setting. Coaches, athletes, team managers, or any members listening to us here into the field, I'm spending a bit of time here onto that point of goal setting because I've seen it over my 25 years experience now with coaching right through from uh, provincial to national to Olympic level. Uh, I've seen these principles of goal setting often be set wrong. So let's have a look at what we are dealing here. It's specific. It's specific to you and specific to the goal and avoid vague and broad goals like I want the team to be the best. Often coaches are also making mistakes just simply by talking. Often we're not thinking because so many things are rolling through our mind. We're not thinking of what we are, we are dealing with. So we need to be really specific. Being specific makes your goals objective, which gives you something to aim for and aspire to. Give yourself a completion date, a deadline to complete the goal by, and a specific number of words to read from the end of the year report. For example, we need to set up this, we need to get there. Not delivering too much of opinion there. Realistic and challenging. Okay, realistic and challenging. Goals should be difficult enough to be challenged. Yes, it should be difficult enough to be challenged, but not so difficult they become unrealistic. Here, we need to make the difference, the differencing point here. Goals should be difficult enough to be challenged, but not so difficult they become unrealistic because why then athletes lose that really that, uh, that, uh, that chance of delivering. This provides you with a challenge. Long-term and short-term goal. See your long-term goal as, a, as the top of the mountain to set, okay, to get uh, to the top. You need to set and achieve smaller goals to reach to the top. Imagine climbing Mount Everest. You cannot just set up today and I said, okay, by tomorrow evening, I'm gonna reach up there. No, there are areas you need to stop. You need to reboost things. You need to look at your, your diet. You need to look at your water. You need to look at your oxygen as you're going up. So achieving these smaller goals by time, okay, will eventually brings you up to the top. So achieving these smaller goals maintains motivation and importantly, attention. Remember here, every journey starts with a single step. Every journey starts with a single step. Coaches, athletes, your logbook, your training book, your diary, your manual, okay? Your day-to-day -day agenda is key important here, okay? If you put it here, sooner or later, it will be forgotten. New thing comes in, it goes back into 13 box and it's soon forgotten. If you want to remember it, ink it. Ink it, don't think it. Make sure you write your goals down. Coaches and athletes. Often I've seen coaches are the only one who have the goals for the athletes. And when we talk to the athletes, what are your goals? You find that the athlete goals are here. The coach's goals are here. So what's happening? Conflicting. We're not having the same level. Okay? So this cannot be underestimated. The action of doing these reinforces your intent to complete the goal. Also, by writing them down, you will not forget any goal and you get the satisfaction of ticking or crossing them off you, as you have achieved them. This is important. As you're doing it, tick it up or highlight it with a different color marker. Okay, this is key. It's daily into my training unit. I highlight things, I mark them down, I write them down. When an athlete achieved the a PB, the date, the time, I'm marking it down. I ink it. I can go back on it and I can see when you did so, when uh, it was down, when it was up, I can really look at it in an evaluation format. Recording them allows you to chart your progress towards your long-term goals and evaluate them, as I just mentioned. 
writing your goals down also allows you to constantly reevaluate your goals. Do you need to reassess and modify your goals? Often there are small hiccups in our preparation, maybe a flu, maybe a, a problems into our daily training. We have to be absent from training for two to three days. We have to relook at the, our whole goals. We have to relook at our training. Often we've had, the, like now, we've just had the COVID-19. We had to relook that. In the early beginning of 2020, I had my beautiful pre 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 uh, periodization. I had my long-term plan, my short-term plan, my daily plan, my weekly plan, and boom, coming to March, bang, COVID-19 hits us. All our athletes have to leave the training centers. Everyone has to go at home, training at home. What do we have to do? Reevaluate our goals, reassess, and modify. So when it is obvious that the goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals. Adjust the action steps, as mentioned by Confucius. Adjust the, the action steps. I did not adjust my goals to my athletes, but I adjusted how we're going to train towards maintaining those goals. Okay, so this is important here. So athletes, ink it, don't think it. Use the training diaries, write them down. If you don't, you will forget it. Consider the goal after the goal. Often when a goal is achieved, we are happy and into the moment of happiness and everything, we forget what comes next. Okay, the goal after the goal. What's the next goal? So this is where another key important aspect comes in, either for an athlete or for coaches or for team officials, managers, and federations. Planning and evaluation. Planning. You need to plan your work properly. Make sure that it is implemented on the second point. Okay, implementation of that plan for training. Through training, again, you're analyzing, you're observing, you're changing here, you're adding extras, you're cutting here. And in order for that performance to happen, when the performance happened, evaluate. What went well? What didn't go so well? From the evaluation, take it up forward, derive a new plan again. Planning, implementation, training, performance, and so repeat the circle of the goal after the goal. So ladies and gentlemen, athletes, coaches, it's important. Planning and evaluation is key. I have evaluation weekly into my training line as a coach, as a high performance coach of uh, Jawa Timur here in Indonesia. I have evaluation planning every single week. I'm sitting down with my coaches discussing what went good, what do you think? Maybe it was that a mistake. We did training too hard today. Maybe tomorrow we have to adjust. So I'm adjusting even the plan for tomorrow. I'm adjusting the plan. I'm readjusting so that we're not moving away from performance. Because if I push too much, it might be dangerous. I might create an injury, not directly linked to uh, with the athletes. Okay, not uh, there. But the training was too hard and it creates a problem. And it will be problem for performance. Okay, what this means that you need to be aware of the next step. Nothing stands still, especially in sport. If you stand still, you will soon fall behind. By being aware of your next goal, you are automatically bring closer, okay, to your completion as you're thinking of the next one. I'm almost over. I want to bring you up here to this famous slides of mine and i have been using it many many presentations whether it is in business whether it is in sports of uh, weightlifting or other sports that i have been uh, working very closely even with kemenpora i have dealt with these slides many many times insanity okay it's a it's a very big uh, slide by albert einstein very big point okay by albert einstein insanity doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Athletes, if there are many of you here, I want you to ponder on that. Coaches, 
Your 2020 program cannot be the same as 2021. Your 2017 training cycles, Olympic cycle for 2016, cannot be the same for 2020. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is not going to happen. If you want to see lights at the end of the tunnel, move. Move forward. Okay? Move from insanity of doing the same thing over and over. Change your, your outlook. Change your perspective to your sport. We need to change. Weightlifting has to be revisited, re-looked at. How we train. How is the training cycles? How is the recovery? How is the loading principles? How are the mechanics? Video analysis. So many things have to be looked into. So I'm bringing this here. It's start to give it a bit of ponder here in terms of psychological aspects as well. On this brings me up to my last slides. Okay, this is me thinking about weightlifting every day. It's not an easy topic, but I'm getting there. I want to say thank you to everyone listening to me. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take anything. This was done in any way by a coach four coaches, four athletes. I'm not a, a clinical psychologist. I'm not a practical psychologist, but just a coach like you as an athlete before. I have been a lot through it and I can share a few of these points with you. Thank you. Thank Carolina, you, Avinash. Yes, you. thank you. Um, excellent, uh, very good points. And, and as, I, as I think about this, um, as we coaches, and uh, anyone who's in education, we of course have the, the COVID situation. And then even if we think about, I, I like your point about the focus that you have, um, let's go back to the 17th century, 18th century, when people would get together and read a book in the evenings when it was, when there was daylight, you could, you had time to read the book. Then we get, get movies that are maybe three hours long then we get sitcoms a half an hour long. And nowadays everyone is on YouTube and the clips are three to five seconds, 10 seconds long. If it's five minutes, people get bored. <laughs> so um, I think these points are when the way you explain them in, in the background there, when we go back to it, those are, um, that's also our future and thinking of how, how do we work on those through that way. Yeah. So, Yes. Um, thank so you, Avinash. If there's any questions? We will have so that please uh, write your questions into the Q&A section, and uh, then we will answer the questions there uh, through the Q&A section, so we don't have a discussion with our attendees here. So um, please use the Q&A section for our questions. Thank you, Avinash. Um, You're welcome. Yes. Moving on. I thank on. Uh, all my listeners as well. And should there be anything, I'm here. Thank you. Yes. Moving on. Can you um, take off your uh, screen share, Avinash? So we will swap over yep. to our co-host. Thank you. And our co-host will put the introduction on for our next presenter, Dr. Kyle Pierce a solid cornerstone in the IWF Coaching and Research Committee. Dr. Kyle Pierce brings his expertise into our work. His dedication to weightlifting is celebrated nationally and internationally as he invites American and international athletes to train at the University of Shreveport, Louisiana. Kyle will be presenting the first IWF Level 1 online course this summer first for the European Weightlifting Federation and then planned for the Pan American Weightlifting Federation. Yes, Colin, I saw your question there. We are moving along on that line. And the CRC hopes to cover all the continents as soon as possible. So the clock is ticking for Dr. Kyle Pierce, ladies and gentlemen. Kyle, you can uh, start sharing your screen here. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Carolina. You're good there.
Yeah, we're good to go. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, for those of you in attendance. Appreciate it. Uh, the topic I'm speaking on today is youth weightlifting, which is uh, not only part of what I do in my profession uh, as a professor, but also it's a passion with me and, and something that I uh, truly love to do is, is work with kids in the sport of weightlifting. Uh, I want to point out, this is a brief overview, so it's not going to go in depth on, on any one topic. Some of the things we'll talk about, though, are safety, the benefits, the development of young athletes, uh, training methods, monitoring the athletes, teaching methods, and, and then finally competition. Question I get it, I'm sure many of you do, is it safe for children? Well, you know, parents ask that all the time, but they don't seem to mind to have the kids go out and do heavy lifting themselves there. Uh, you know, kids would, would benefit, I've, you know, most of the kids I've worked with have, have learned to pick things up correctly and will probably have less uh, issues with their back as they, as they get older. As you can see, naturally this, this, this young child is lifting uh, this big pumpkin up incorrectly with a rounded back. Now, we also hear about growth plate damage, uh, particularly uh, the epiphyses of the long bones. And there's very few retrospective case studies regarding this. But those that do, they, they cite improper lifting techniques, uh, maximal lifts, and a key is lack of qualified supervision, which we'll, we'll keep talking about. Uh, injuries and, and weightlifting, uh, this parallels what we see in other sports as well. Not much different. Poor technique, excessive loading, fatigue training, uh, fatigue management is very important. And, and we see in many sports that when athletes become fatigued, uh, often there are injuries. Poorly designed equipment. Um, and if, if some people are doing resistance training with using machines for assistance exercises, uh, most of these are designed for adults. So the, the equipment needs to fit the child. Ready access to the equipment. It means that the gym, gym is left open and kids can just go in there on, on their own unsupervised, uh, which we shouldn't do. And again, lack of qualified adult supervision. Now, there's several studies here showing that the rates of injuries are not excessive and uh, that there's not evidence of, of severe injuries or uh, uh, extensive injury. So there's numerous studies. I can provide any of this information. If anybody wants it, I'll give my email at the end. This is a classic study by Brian Hamill. Uh, it was a survey done in, in uh, England. And we can see that, that weightlifting was very low on the list. In fact, weightlifting was lower than weight training. And I assume that's because of the supervision and the sport of weightlifting uh, probably uh, more attended to than in just general weight training. Interesting to see how attitudes have changed. Uh, in 2001, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a position statement. And one of their recommendations at, at the end was that pre-adolescents and adolescents should avoid competitive weightlifting, uh, powerlifting, bodybuilding and maximal lifts until they, re they reach uh, physical and skeletal maturity. They really weren't up on what weightlifting was. In fact, they didn't even spell it right back then. Uh, in 2008, they came out with a second, another paper. Uh, I actually knew of a, a former weightlifter who knew somebody that had some influence with the uh, academy and, and sent him quite a few research studies. And, and it was considered in this paper. In fact, in the recommendation, adolescent, pre-adolescents and adolescents should avoid powerlifting, bodybuilding, and maximal lifts until they reach physical and skeletal maturity. Notice that weightlifting was taken out of there. And in the body of the paper, they addressed uh, the sport. These are the studies that, that they cited. And again, I can make those available to you. Uh, they came out with their 
a statement again in 2020, and it's interesting to see how things have really changed here. And one of their recommend recommendations, they suggest incorporate weightlifting exercises and their derivatives into an exercise program, again, under, under the direction of a qualified professional. Progress from wooden dowel to an unloaded bar as resistance training skill competency improves. So we can see that the people's attitudes, uh, influential organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics have changed as they've really seen uh, what the sport has to offer. Some of the recommended guidelines to keep things safe, you need good equipment, good facility, uh, again, good supervision and a good training program, a good plan. You can make your own equipment um, to, to fit the child more, but be very careful. In certain countries, you're, you're liable for lawsuits. Um, if, if you make the equipment and the child gets hurt, then, then you're liable. So be very careful if you are using equipment that, that you make. Make sure that it's good. Some of the benefits in general, health-related fitness, which is uh, cardiorespiratory endurance, body composition, flexibility, muscular strength and endurance. Uh, you know, weight, weightlifting can affect all those. Can, it, there is some research uh, demonstrating its effects on cardiorespiratory fitness. Of course, muscular strength and endurance are obvious, but there's also uh, been demonstrated changes and improvements in flexibility and body composition. Uh, it's been shown that it, it helps in injury prevention with other sports that children play. It enhances their sport performance. And there's a number of psychological benefits that are associated with a good program. Now, it just doesn't happen that if you come to a weightlifting program that you're going to, it's going to improve your psychological uh, aspects. But if it's a good program and done properly, it can. Uh, Self-esteem is a key one. I think that's why I've, I've coached other sports, uh, American football and, and athletics. And, uh, you know, I, I like weightlifting because you can do so many things to uh, manipulate the training and the, and the competition lifts that, that, you know, boost that self-esteem with kids. And it's so, it's so rewarding to see a kid just feel better about themselves. Uh, and, you know, that the result of of what, what's going on in the gym there. Uh, training programs, as it says, with some differences, follow the, the basic principles and concepts regardless of age. The differences for children depend on a number of uh, psychological, physiological, and environmental factors. Uh, one thing that's very important is chronological age related to the age of expected peak performance. Physical and men mental maturity are important. And then, of course, genetic potential. Now, let's look at uh, regarding chronological versus physiological age. Let's look at Naeem, uh, maybe the best weight lift lifter of, of modern times, three-time uh, Olympic winner, uh, just phenomenal. He began training at 10 years old and, and uh, set his first world record at the age of 15 years, nine months. Uh, in many, most Western countries, uh, he probably wouldn't have been able to get, in, get into the gym at the time. So some things have changed. Uh, some environmental factors, uh, current factors that may uh, be regarded as, as far as starting age, uh, current involvement in sports, uh, particularly those activities that develop coordination, agility, flexibility, uh, things like gymnastics and dancing are ex excellent prerequisites uh, to participation in weightlifting. A lot of the, the, the boys I coach, I've, I've suggested the little dance class to improve their coordination, but I don't get very good response too often. So, what age do you start? Now, we're just going to look at a couple different uh, opinions here. Uh, the recommended age in, a, in, in Bulgaria was it started at 12 years old and, and, and after a while shifted to 10 years old. 
uh, according to BAMPA, uh, suggested uh, age to begin practice was 11 to 13, specialization at 15 to 16, and high performance 21 to 28. Now notice, you know, people always say, when did you start weightlifting? And, and it depends, it's not, you know, there's different uh, things to consider because we're not, as we go through this, we'll see that it's not just about jumping up there the first day and doing snatches and cleaning charts. There's a process that leads to this. Uh, more recently, bump in half, uh, to begin training 14 to 15, start specialization 17 to 18, and highest performance achieved 23 to 27. A good article that it's, this is online, available to you, uh, the Canadian Weightlifting Federation uh, had a nice piece on long-term athlete development. They talk about uh, from, from birth to, to, to the end there. Uh, we see that uh, it, in the beginning with young kids, it should be fun, fundamental. Just do simple things. Let kids play and enjoy themselves uh, and develop good uh, athletic skills. Learn to train. You can see it's a little bit younger for the females. So again, it's there's a range there. So it depends on the individual. Uh, personally, I've had, I like the kids between nine and 12. Nine's been the youngest that I've seen success with. We've had uh, two kids that started at nine that went on, one went on to play American professional football. The other one's a professional golfer. So, you know, doing the weightlifting and they did the Olympic style movements. It didn't, you know, it enhanced their uh, athletic careers there. Um, a weightlifter that I coached that made three Olympic teams, he started at 11. So it, it's worked for me. I've found that those ages do work pretty well to start the, start the kids out. And weightlifting fitness for all sports, the suggested age, initial stage of training, 11 to 16, stage of proper training, 16 to 18, and stage of improving sport mastership was 19 to 20. Uh, I, I want to describe that they did a good job, uh, and, and Ayan and Baroga here go on to describe the several years here. These are just some key points. Uh, in the first year, if you start at 11, it says acquire many sided physical preparation. That's just doing a lot of activities and just learning the most elementary weightlifting exercises. Uh, the character of the training general physical development, uh, specialized training, not over 40%, develop the whole body, the nervous system, uh, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, just, you know, you want to just work on things that are going to uh, prepare you for later sport development. So these are some things that we do with our kids here. Of course, we had the math uh, training. Some practical things, athletics, sprints, maybe some longer runs, nothing real long distance, jumps, throwing the weights, the bed balls, uh, some simple gymnastics, and, and play, play a lot of sports, basketball, volleyball. You know, try to do all these. Now, a lot of times that's out of your control. Because like myself, I'm in the weightlifting gym. They come, they come to me for weightlifting. If I take them out and start playing volleyball and running relay races all the time, they're going to take them somewhere else. But, you know, you can try to encourage that, depending on your situation, to, you know, promote the kids to continue and play other sports up until a certain age when they need to specialize more. Uh, Second year, you can see that, the, that there's more specialized training, okay? And as it said, you know, enlargement of the activity of the learning training do the correct habits of execution during the first year. You need to learn it to do it correct early on. Because sometimes those uh, bad habits are hard to undo. And over the years, uh, you know, more and more on the on, on working on the technique of the classical exercises and less 
general physical preparation, but it still continues over the years. Okay. See, finally, finally, by the fourth year, uh, seventy percent specialized training, but still uh, continuing with some uh, general physical preparation. Okay. Now, what what I've observed is that compared to many weightlifters, and in, in, in this plan, more time is spent on general physical uh, development, general physical preparation in the earlier years. And, and, and we talk about long-term athlete development. I think it should be followed, but I, I still see too many people wanting things too much, too quick from young kids. So you need to be patient and start with as much general physical development as you can and gradually increase the specialized weightlifting training over the years. It should be building blocks. Each one, each phase should be built on the previous phase. Now, a lot of countries use talent ID. Uh, that's great if you're in that type of country and you're in that situation, but not all countries can, you know, take a group of people and, and, and test them and say, okay, you're gonna be a weightlifter. Uh, doesn't work that way in many countries. We, we get who comes into the gym. Uh, but also the talent ID uh, type test can be used as a screening uh, for injury prevention and to assess their readiness to start the sport of weightlifting. Talking about this, uh, I wanna talk about some mistakes, I think that, you know, starting with the talent identification there that oftentimes people make uh, concerning copying other systems without understanding the complete process. Uh, certain countries can't do what the Chinese do. You know, we're not all gonna be able to uh, have that support and those resources and that the conditions are different. Uh, sometimes we don't look at the big picture. And again, applying only part of the system, uh, you know, missing the overall concept of the long-term progressive training uh, is so important. Everything needs to be included or modifications must be made. So you can't, if you're gonna copy the Chinese training plan, you need to copy everything the Chinese are doing or whatever country that you view as successful. Uh, says here, unfortunately, many coaches miss the big picture and immediately initiate exclusive high intensity specialized training. Here's some considerations. Modifications must be made to fit your specific situation. You know, you may have different athletes. You may not have those that are uh, genetically gifted. They need to know their adaptive capabilities, their availability to train. They may not be right there. They may not be in a sports school. Um, of course, willingness to train is important as well. Uh, what are their basic needs? I mean, are they eating? Um, do they have enough, you know, they have good shelter, good, good living conditions, all those. Um, again, some athletes are compensated. And, and if you have athletes that are not compensated as, as far as any uh, rewards, uh, that, may, that may be an issue as well. So again, in, in copying programs, these need to be some considerations. So adapt, adapt those successful programs to fit your situation if you're gonna do that. Um, Financial resources, some successful programs have trained coaches, paid coaches, um, excellent facilities and equipment. Transportation, I always say, is so key. If you can't get to the gym, you can't train, no matter how, how talented you are. Uh, I didn't include, but parental support is very important too. Uh, again, we need financial resources for travel, sports medicine support, Sports science support. So consider all these factors when you look at successful programs of other countries, make sure you modify them to fit your specific needs. Another thing is uh, try to be aware of what goes on in your athletes' lives because this affects their ability to adapt, work, social life, uh, whether they're sleeping enough, nutrition, environment, all these things can uh, affect your sport performance and your adaptation to the training. Remember, it's about adaptation too. I think we oftentimes forget that. We just look at the program. We got to look at the total program. We got to look at the, the recovery as well. What we want to do is enable our athletes to recover from what they do 
can adapt and move to a higher level and increase their performance. I can't emphasize enough in the training process to, to try to gain as much knowledge you, as you can in the sports sciences. If you have some countries have sports scientists available, which is, which is uh, you know, that's the gold standard. But as a coach, most of us are not in that situation and we need to do what we can do to learn as much about uh, all the sports sciences. Uh, my friend Mike Stone always says, you know, doctors spend two years studying science to then uh, uh, practice the art of medicine, where coaches should study science, study physiology, biomechanics, psychology, motor learning, motor development. Study those sciences so you can better practice the art of coaching. We always talk about coaching as a combination of, of both science and art. Uh, good programs are important. And, you know, when we're first learning after the teaching process uh, that, that we should put, put the young kids in a, in a periodized plan program. Planning is so important. Be aware of timelines too. Um, you know, look at an athlete over a lifetime. That's hard to do oftentimes for a coach. They're just worried about how they're going to do with the youth championships in, in six months, you know? If you're really going to do, you know, do the right thing, you're going to work with those, those kids uh, to develop them when it's really important, when they're at that, that age, that they're going to excel. Uh, so make sure that you are aware of timelines, make sure that you plan. Block periodization works well. Uh, in youth programs, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the IWF Club Coach Course, which basically follows a, a block periodization uh, program. Now, as I can't, uh, as I've emphasized before, uh, you try to get a, as much sports science support and sports medicine support as you can. I've recommended to some people that are in close to universities. Universities are always looking for. Uh, that have sports science programs are always looking for subjects and always wanting people to participate in studies. And oftentimes you can maybe swap out, you know, you can, they could work with your weightlifters and, and do some research and in, in exchange for some uh, sports science support there and try to seek out as much sports medicine as you can there. Uh, one of the things, even though it's simple, there's a lot of sophisticated recovery methods, but I think some of the simple things, of course, a good program is important for uh, recovery adaptation. Uh, record keeping is good. Always have that training log and you can track sleep uh, and nutrition and um, even water, which is part of nutrition with, with young kids. So I think at an early age, they need, there needs to be some form of monitor, monitoring uh, with the kids that you coach. Now, as far as teaching, there's different philosophies. Uh, people teach whole method, part method, uh, top, down, bottom up, or combinations of all these. Um, you know, my suggestion is, you know, try to know as many methods as you can because, you know, people learn differently. Uh, and as coaches, the more tools we have in our tool belt there, the better we're able to fix things. And, 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 and build things. And I think if we, you know, people respond to different uh, stimuli and the more uh, ways we know to teach, uh, the better we're gonna, we're gonna do. Of course, we've already mentioned about using the PVC pipes. Uh, technique should definitely be the first priority. Now, the IWF uh, club coach course, the level one, these are the these are the contents here. You can see it goes over a lot of good things that are associated with, uh, it's basically a, 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 a course in uh, teaching young people, teaching children how to lift weights here. Talks about safety, it has a little sports science in it. Uh, warming up and stretching, uh, has some basic lifting information, basic lift preparation, and then it goes into the classical lifts there. Uh, deals with competitions, training programs, and anti-doping there. So I'm gonna uh, use that a little bit here. 
Uh, they start with a basic lift preparation. This is before you do any weightlifting. And so the kids would, would learn how to do some basic lifts that would prepare them to do weightlifting. I kind of do snatch and clean and jerk the first day. Uh, they're going to do two different programs, front squat, deadlift, behind the neck press, and some simple uh, general physical preparation exercises on day one. And day two, uh, back squat, snatch grip, deadlift, behind the neck press with a snatch grip, and then some general preparation exercises. And, and the suggestion is that these be done four sets of five repetitions. Two days, a, two days a week is probably enough. You know, again, we talk about transportation is an issue. Uh, in many cases, it's parents that are going to bring their kids to the, to the workout. And if you get beyond two early on, uh, they may quit. You got to get them in there a couple days a week, get them hooked. Uh, get them loving the sport, and they'll they'll start showing up more. So th these are just examples here. And what I'm giving is a sample, using this as a sample of a, of a good, sound program based on science that works with kids. So we're going to do the front squat, clean deadlift, and the behind the neck press in the uh, first workout there, okay, for day one. Okay. Now, also, and they talk about a way to teach. They have, um, there's a power clean sequence. It's, you know, there's other ways to do it, but this one works. It's good. Jumping with the barbell, mid-thigh, uh, doing, doing cleans from the mid-thigh, doing cleans from the knee, below the knee, and from the platform. Now, this is over time, and there's a, a progression over time, uh, which will teach you how to do the power clean, and then you'll eventually trend, um transition into doing the squat clean. I'm always concerned about using kids in their pictures. So I had a bunch of pictures before, but I didn't have parental um, permission. So I had to take a bunch, all these pictures were taken yesterday. So these are the kids that I, some of the kids that I work with on a, on a daily basis. So I'm, 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 I have a great time every day. I got to, had to get their parents' permission there. Uh, same thing with the power snatch sequence. We go from the mid thigh to the knee, below the knee, and from the platform. Uh, then there's progressions taught for transitioning from the power snatch into the uh, full snatch, overhead squat, pressing snatch balance, push press snatch balance, and snatch balance. Yeah. So the jerk, uh, there's a sequence there. Push press, behind the neck, push press, power jerk behind the neck, power jerk, do some footwork for the jerk, and then finally learn to do the jerk. So the sequence, and there's a plan to teach. Uh, you know, simple little training plan. Now, now what's important is, is somebody's gonna say, well, how do you know percentages with the young kids? Uh, you're not going to do this, this cycle and this plan here until the kids are proficient, after they've gone through the basic preparation. And, you know, how long is that? That's, that's you as a coach should know that. That's where the art comes in of, of coaching. You should have the science to back it up. But uh, when, the, when the, the, the kids are proficient, you'll know when to do a, a maximum lift. And, and there's been research on that, 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 that they're doing maximum lifts on occasions is not detrimental. The problem exists when it, where they're done over and over and over again. So on occasions, if their technique is, is proficient, they can do the max and then, and then work off the percentages. And this is a good simple plan that you can see. Uh, there's a lot of variation in it. It follows the principles of, of periodization here, but it still includes some general physical preparation, jumps and pull-ups and and such. They're pretty good on that shot, huh? <laughs> All right. Cycle two, of course, you can see that the, the repetitions are going down. The intensity is increasing, but there's still variation within the weeks there. Okay. Again, still got the general physical preparation. Cycle three. Uh, the lifts of uh, the intensity is, is going up to 100%. 
and the volume is decreasing, just like following the, the, the concept of periodization. And then finally, after this would be a 12 week program and the 13th week, you would have a competition. So it's a good, good program. It's not very, it's not complicated, uh, but it works. Now, some other things to consider too, uh, it's not just the, the technique of the movements, but as we know that, that we're trying to develop power. And so both force and velocity are important. We did a study uh, quite a long time ago, uh, looking at this and we found that daily maximum lifts are counterproductive. Uh, we found that working at 75 to 85% worked very well, but also we lowered the weight if the velocity dropped. So we need to not go too heavy uh, too often and develop poor skills with those kids. Be patient. Uh, skill mastery must proceed lifting heavy weights. Uh, try to maintain high bar velocity. Uh, drop the weight if you need to. You can modify there. You're the coach. Uh, and, and maintenance of technique. Developing those optimal neuromuscular patterns should be an overriding goal in training. Competitions are important. I mean, kids are going to lose interest if they can't compete. Uh, and and you can you can do things like have a you know simple handicap, uh, give the you know uh, a handicap for the for the um, heavy versus light. You can have a personal best competition. You can divide the group into teams that keeps the kids motivated there and that develops that camaraderie. Uh, so there's a lot of different competitions you can do. As a coach, I've always encouraged coaches to, at, at the early competitions, to don't go so heavy with the kids. You know, oftentimes if they can make all six lifts, they build that confidence, which is so important. They're happy. And after a number of years of making six lifts on the on, on the platform, when they go to the bigger competitions, they believe they can make every lift uh, with every weight that's loaded on that bar. These are just some things. This is not so much research, but some things of, of what I've uh, learned over the years as far as coaching tips. The, development, the developmental considerations are important. You, you need to be aware of those as a coach. Early emphasis on technique. Don't get too excited. Uh, don't rush. I'll work on that technique. Of course, the coach needs to have a knowledge of correct techniques. Um, technique and strength are integrated. Oftentimes, if you get a little bit stronger, your technique is going to improve. So they, they work hand in hand. As I mentioned before, remember there's individual learning styles. So the, the more methods and more ways we know to teach, the better. Keep a positive atmosphere in the, in the, in the gym. You know, it, um, we talk about feedback with the kids. I remember when I first started lifting, I asked someone to, a coach to tell me what I was doing wrong. And uh, the coach said to me, actually it was a training partner. Back then we all just sort of coached each other. And um, I ask him to tell me, you know, what I'm doing wrong. And he says, I'll tell you what you're doing wrong, but I'll also tell you what you're doing right. That meant a lot to me. I think oftentimes as coaches, we're always looking for what's wrong. And, and yeah, we need to use corrective feedback, but, you know, that positive feedback is so good. Kids want to hear what they're doing right. You know, they may have had a bad day in school, didn't do anything right, didn't do anything right at home. They come to the gym, they do one thing right. Let them know it. Reinforce the things that they're doing right and keep it positive in the gym there. Of course, coaches need to have good training programs for the kids. Uh, coaches have, have to have a passion for learning. The, the coaches here definitely do have that passion for learning. It should, it should just be through a lifetime. I have a genuine concern for the athlete. You know, it's important, I, you know, um, don't be phony, but you know, it's nice to, I always like to know that the coach had concerned more for me about, you know, what I could do on the, on the field or in the gym or on the platform uh, than what's going on in my life. And sometimes it's nice to ask the kid, well, you know, how'd your day go in school today? You know, what's going on? What are you going to do this weekend? You know, 
show some concern for the athletes and, and let them know that you're concerned about them. They may have needs beyond. Um, you know, I know people that have coached for years have, have no problems in helping kids out that have, you know, don't have enough feet or good places to stay. And, and they and they try to help them with those basic needs as well. So uh, be concerned for the athletes you coach, not just on, on what they can do for you, but you know what goes on in, in the other parts of their lives. Uh, remember that coaches help dreams come true. So you know be very serious and be prepared for what you do. I think maybe one of the, the greatest things is to have patience, especially if you're working with kids. Don't try to get things done overnight. Take your time. You know, I live in Louisiana. We, they cook a lot of good food here. We got something called gumbo. And, and if you ever come to Louisiana, you love that gumbo. I'll make sure you get to eat some. But it takes a long time to cook that gumbo. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. So if you rush that, it's not going to be good. And it's like, you know, when you're coaching with kids, take your time with them. You know, be patient with them. Um, those are some of my uh, coaching tips, personal ones there. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the two guys that always I can call anytime and they always help me out with my talks are, are Dr. Mike Stone and Lynn Jones. They're always, they're always there when I need them. Uh, this is my email, kyle.pierce, that's L-S-U-S, not one S-U-S, dot E-D-U. And I'll be glad to share any information I have with you. If I don't have the answers, and I don't always have the answers, I'll be glad to search them out and do my best to get uh, that information that you need. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, thank you guys for, for, for attending this, and uh, hope to see a lot of y'all face-to-face soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Yes, face-to-face, -face, say no more. Um, great. Um, uh, pretty good uh, pictures also. You'll, you'll do a great photographer. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, again, I come to the, you know, we're in this phase when the world has probably changed a lot since 2012 when smartphones became available for a lot of kids. And, you know, how especially important you talk about the building blocks that they have to be there before going forward. And uh, that's uh, definite. And even if you have a young lifter and they have their building blocks, you still have the same building blocks if you have a lifter that's a little bit older and they're beginner. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that the base is there to start working on. Yes. Um, there is a question that has come in, uh, whether we have these PowerPoints available. And um, so you can uh, contact uh, Kyle directly, he had his uh, email address there to get his uh, PowerPoint. And um, and then I answered to one of them that um, we will be, this will be recorded, it is recorded and it will be uh, viewable on YouTube so that you have that material there. And um, and if we have any questions, it seems like we don't have any questions. Our presentations have been perfect, uh, easy to understand and um, and people uh, or then people are too timid to ask questions straight away. So um, I'm almost planning to uh, move on to the next point is to uh, talk about our webinar number two. We have Dr. Yunichi Okada here and as a panelist. And uh, next week, uh, next I'm sorry, in the next webinar, he will be presenting. Um, they have a Japanese research completed at the 2019 Junior Worlds, and uh, he will present on that. And the date for that is planned is uh, July 12th. And um, so we are uh, working on that next. And then our last one would be in September. It is planned for September the 3rd. Um, and uh, so I would like to um, thank everyone at this moment. Um, I think talking about weightlifting is always the, uh, the fun and uh, an easy thing. And, uh, and then all this technical stuff, um, sorry about our uh, screen sharing issues here, uh, but um, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, we will be um, wrapping up now. So um, thank you everyone. And, uh, Hope to see you in July. Bye-bye.